Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> they already cut off two minutes, so. <laughs> no, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. It's great to be back here. Um, it's always a good time to be at CalGEM, and it's always great to connect with like-minded people because, as you know, there's far too few of us. So we're going to do a talk today that's a little bit different than some of the talks that I've done before. This has a lot of history. And one of the reasons that I chose to put this together, and, and this is partly from the thing that's inside of my book, like that Giles was telling you about with the, with the postcards, is that we don't learn history anymore. They don't really teach history in schools. We kind of think it's old stuff. What does it matter? If, if I can't tweet it and text it, it's not important. But if we don't understand how we got to where we are, we're just going to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And if we keep making the same mistakes going over again on this particular issue, it's going to be the end of us. It's going to be the end of our rights. As, as uh, Dr. Wakefield was saying in his last talk, it's going to be the end of boys. If one in two boys are, are autistic, it's going to be the end of our military. It's going to be the end of most everything. So this is a really important issue. As most of you know, I've been involved in the whole vaccine world since September of 2000. So I've been doing this for a really long time. I've spent well over 20,000 hours of my personal time investigating this. I probably spend anywhere from two to 20 hours per week reading vaccine-related articles. Our vaccine research library has over 7,000 articles in it gleaned from the medical literature. Every week, 10 or 12 more come out. So the material is, not, is, is, is perpetual. It doesn't ever really stop. And the material that we have put together shows the problems with vaccines. <clears throat> So the reason that I wanted to do this and where this history is going to start from is how did the public health department, because everything now is all about public health, right? And all these bills and everything that um, HHS is kind of doing to us and at us. How did public health become the master of our life? I mean, how did we go from an independent country founded on principles of liberty to this nanny state where we've got the uh, health and human services, you know, sticking their, their nose under every area of our tent? Well, this sort of starts back a long time ago. <clears throat> it starts way back, way back, way, way back with the whole issue of quarantine. And this is where the whole issue of public health first came from. Because what public health was supposed to do from its very inception and from the very beginning was to protect us and to kind of clean up society from infectious disease. So way back in the 1600s, before we were ever even a country, we had a bunch of colonies. We had all the colonies along the eastern seaboard. Those were where all of the, all the cities were and all the ports were, and where the, the, uh, the people came from around the world to come to the, the New Americas. <clears throat> in 1701, I keep making note of that, Se like 1700, 1701 was the first U.S. Quarantine Act when we didn't even have a U.S. yet, but they were already passing bills that had to do with public health because it was such a pervasive problem 200 years ago. Make note of that. It was a pervasive, huge problem 200 years ago. I personally think as you go through this, you'll see it doesn't really equate to where we are today. At that time, there were ships arriving from infected ports around the world. They had to sit at anchor for 40 days before passengers could come ashore. And the slave trade was bringing yellow fever from Africa, and the um, immigrants from Russia and in Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, were spreading a lot of cholera and typhoid, which was the major, major conditions that were happening at that time, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. It was the, the, the public health, because there was no sanitation. I mean, there was no, there was no water, there was no sewage, there were, you couldn't go in somewhere and flush a, you know, push a knob and flush a toilet. That was the whole thing where honey buckets came from, where everybody did their business in literally in a bucket, and where men and women walked down the street while the wait lady was on the inside of the street and the man was on the outside of the street, because the second floor of people would just dump their honey buckets over the top. So that was what sanitation was not during that period of time. <clears throat> Um, and note that smallpox was way down the list of concerns. Now, the smallpox vaccine really wasn't invented 
really invented in a commercial way until 1798, 1799, when Jenner supposedly found that cowpox, if you were inoculated with cowpox, you would not get smallpox. But when the smallpox vaccine was actually developed, the whole reason wasn't because there were raging epidemics and there were millions of people around the world dying from smallpox that they were so terribly concerned about. What they were really concerned about was smallpox is that that virus had a particular predilection for the sebum glands, the, the sweat glands, and the oil glands of the face. And that's why when you see a lot of pictures, you see all the nodules and things like that of when smallpox was an epidemic. So when Lady Montague came back from Turkey and was starting to do her inoculation of the smallpox uh, scabs into the, in, into the public, it wasn't about people like us. It wasn't about the, the general public they were so concerned about. What they were concerned about was the aristocracy, because if the aristocracy contracted smallpox, it meant that they must have been doing something with the lower class that they shouldn't. $7 can get you a romance novel, a number one combo at In-N-Out Burger, a 12-pack of granola bars, a cup of green juice, or one month of access to the Cal Jam Network. At Cal Jam, we take pride in the array of topics our speakers have covered over the past eight years. With the Cal Jam Network membership, most of our speakers' talks can be accessed. In our network, you can also find numerous seminars from the Dead Chiropractic Society's monthly meeting with over 100 chiropractors and some of the best speakers in the profession. The Cal Jam Network is your all-access pass to Cal Jam and DCS workshops, videos, and chiropractic content. From past Cal Jam speakers to recent DCS seminars, the network is a great resource for anybody passionate about chiropractic health or global sustainability. So don't miss out. We upload new and exciting content monthly, which can stream on any device, even your smartphone. Join the CalJam Network today for only seven bucks a month at caljam.org forward slash network.